and again, as we'll discuss later, that the armed forces in question have no finite control uh, over the situation. Human rights law, of course, has more to say when it comes to law enforcement, which presupposes um, a significant degree of control. And this is an important distinction when it comes to discussions of occupation. Now, I'm oversimplifying, but I think it's a useful uh, oversimplification. But perhaps most importantly of all, when we're looking at the differences between the bodies of law, is the fact that IHL, uh, International Humanitarian Law, IHL, does not question the existence of violence on a grand scale. It doesn't stand in judgment on that. Indeed, it, it presumes it. So it seeks not so much to alter that state as, and this is a little paradoxical from a human rights perspective, as to ensure that this large-scale violence is conducted with a minimum respect for humanity. Uh, and this does sit ill at ease, I think, with, with um, human rights law. And I'm going to quote here, because I think it's an excellent quote by uh, US academic uh, Theodore Meron, who some of you may be familiar with. Unlike human rights law, the law of war allows, or at least tolerates, the killing and wounding of innocent human beings not directly participating in an armed conflict, such as civilian victims of lawful collateral damage. It also permits certain deprivations of personal freedom without convictions in a court of law. It allows an occupying power to resort to internment, and it limits the appeal rights of detained persons. It permits far-reaching limitations on freedoms of expression and assembly. So, I think he's put more vividly than I can some really fundamental tensions between the two bodies of law. But of course, some, are, some commentators argue that, that one could begin to see in human rights jurisprudence, human rights jurisprudence, the emerging notion of a right to peace. So the, a, a notion that aggressive war can in itself be a, a human rights violation. So if this is true, if this right is emerging in, in, in our understanding of the law, it would suggest an even bigger tension between human rights law and, and humanitarian law, in the sense that to the extent that human rights law views aggressive war as a human rights violation, attempts to reconcile itself with humanitarian law, which does not uh, recognize the concept of an aggressive war, will, will ultimately prove futile or even worse, would entail a watering down of the human rights uh, provisions to tolerate the existence of, of this aggressive uh, war. Human rights, by their nature, protect the person at all times, as we've seen. So this would, of course, include situations of conflict. One could argue logically, in fact, that such rights become particularly relevant in situations of particular vulnerability and I would suggest a situation of conflict is a situation of particular vulnerability. So I think we could say that whilst violating international humanitarian law involves by definition violating human rights, the same is not necessarily true in reverse. Um, but it would be wrong to conclude by virtue of human rights law's broader application to, to all situations and by its virtue of, uh, that it recognizes individual standing, um, that it necessarily affords a higher level of protection uh, to individuals. Human rights have to be balanced against the rights of others uh, and they can often, as I've just pointed out, be limited for security reasons. Um, Humanitarian law does not allow for any limitation of its rights. And it also, in places, contains more detailed provisions for the protection uh, of individuals than is the case under international human rights law. For example, um, as regards provisions on notification of detention to the family of the interned in Geneva Convention 4. Much more detailed provisions than exist uh, under human rights law, or as regards the right of families to know the fate of their missing relatives. Until recently, international humanitarian law was much more advanced than um, human rights law. So, 
we can see at the outset there's some areas where they're compatible with each other and some interesting areas where, where there are tensions. But going back to the, the question that Professor Adrianus gave at the beginning, I, I would suggest that despite the differences that, that I've noted, the answer is reality. It is not a myth. There are heavy uh, and increasing linkages between these two bodies um, of law. The interest, of course, lies in teasing out the nature and the implications and the gaps in these linkages. So I think there's a clear consensus that human rights law and humanitarian law can operate in the same environment. But that has not always been the case. Um, and questions remain as to the extent of the overlap. This debate, of course, on the interaction of the two bodies of law has taken on a new relevance in, in our world post September uh, the 11th, as the nature of conflict, uh, uh, experts like to call it asymmetrical conflict, um, and the array of responses to it um, has rendered the need for legal clarity, I think, uh, uh, ever more urgent. So what I'm going to do for the bulk of the talk is, is, is try uh, very inexpertly uh, to outline how the two bodies of law came together, where I think we are now, uh, and what some of the outstanding issues are as a result of that convergence. So we'll take the first first. I think one of the great achievements, I would say the greatest um, uh, uh, achievement in terms of, uh, of our understanding of human dignity in, in globally post-Second World War has been the appreciation that the human rights of the individual uh, is a legitimate subject of international concern. Uh, and that this recognition, as imperfect as its application is, um, has been vital in strengthening the protections we all enjoy. Because prior to that, human rights were essentially seen as a matter of constitutional law, uh, defining one important aspect of an individual vis-a-vis uh, -vis his or her government, and that was that. Um, humanitarian law, of course, focused on interstate relations, uh, and particularly the reciprocal expectations of, of two states, uh, two parties to a war, 